Here we're going to look at two general principles that relate to connecting the initial and final states of a transition with the transition probability and transition rate. And they are the Frank Condon principle and Fermi's golden rule. So a little bit of a preamble before we get to that about the relative speeds of nuclei and electrons. If we look at the masses of the proton and electron, we understand immediately why electrons move so much faster than protons. They're much, much lighter. And so nuclear speeds are much slower than those of electrons, particularly considering most nuclei contain more than one proton. This has two important implications for photophysical transitions. If we think about radiative transitions, radiative transitions purely involve the motion of electrons as light's electromagnetic field interacts with the negative charge of the electron. What this means is that the nuclear positions basically don't change at all in a radiative transition due to the relative kinetics of nuclear motion and the transition itself, the radiative transition itself. So in, in terms of potential energy surfaces, what this means is that if we start, for example, at the equilibrium geometry of the lower state, and the molecule absorbs a photon, the energy will increase to the excited state without any horizontal motion along the nuclear coordinate axis, this x-axis of the potential energy surface. In essence, the radiative transition is what we call vertical, because if we look on a potential energy surface diagram, the transition is vertical, and you will, you will see this, and in fact, we've already seen radiative transitions drawn as vertical up or down arrows. This is because the transitions are so fast, nuclear positions do not change throughout the entire transition. What about non-radiative transitions? Well, for non-radiative transitions, we assume that nuclear motions do not change. There are no abrupt changes in nuclear motion as a non-radiative transition takes place. In essence, and again in the language of potential energy surfaces, this means that non-radiative transitions are horizontal. They happen between states of equal energy as nuclei move through their typical vibrational motions without any abrupt changes in vibrational motion. So for example, say we were thinking again about two electronic states, one slightly higher than another, and we have our initial point, our initial representative point right here in some vibrational level of the ground state, the non-radiative transition will take place as that representative point moves in this vibrational level and at some point, just due to a quantum probability, becomes governed by the excited state vibrational level at the same energy. Any movement up or down in a non-radiative transition has to involve dissipating energy to the solvent. And as a non-radiative transition occurs, essentially the electrons are just following the nuclei along for the ride. They're adjusting so quickly to every change in nuclear position, they don't in some sense really feel that a transition has taken place. Non-radiative transitions are horizontal. Now that we've laid down this groundwork, we can ask about the relative rates or, or relative likelihood of a transition given, you know, for example, the energy gap between the initial and final states or given the differences in equilibrium positions of the initial and final states. And this is where the Frank Condon principle and Fermi's golden rule come into play. If we start from the idea that radiative transitions are vertical, we think about two excited states with very different equilibrium geometries. Then Vertical excitation from the ground state surface to the excited state surface is going to put the representative point on not at the equilibrium geometry and in fact near an edge potentially of the excited state potential energy surface. The Frank Condon principle states that the most favorable, most rapid, strongest, etc. transitions occur when the vertical excitation connects two vibrational wave functions with a great deal of overlap. This tends to happen when the structures of the initial and final states are most similar. In other words, when those equilibrium geometries, those minima, are close in terms of the nuclear coordinates. 
Without spending too much time on this, I'll refer you to the linked video here, and I will also link to the video on YouTube, which is a really nice explanation of the Frank Condon principle and all of its gory detail. I think the most straightforward way for us to proceed is to first note that we can define what's called a Frank Condon factor and look at the Frank Condon factor for a vertical excitation to get an idea of how allowed or how favorable the transition is. Frank Condon factor is the overlap of the vibrational wave functions in the initial and final states. So for example here, if we imagine a non-radiative transition from this level to this one, we can identify a region of overlap, and it's actually very tiny in this particular case, where the two wave functions are overlapping. The magnitude of that overlap is the Frank Condon factor, and the larger that is, the more favorable the transition. This is the essence of the Frank Condon principle. Practically, the Frank Condon principle matters because it gives us insight into how similar an excited state structure is to the ground state structure. And if we know something about that, for example, we're dealing with a very rigid molecule that is unlikely to go to undergo profound structural change upon photo excitation, we can be reasonably confident that we'll be exciting from the zero vibrational level to the zero vibrational level of the excited state. We can also see in relatively well-resolved absorption and emission spectra the vibrational structure as transitions become more and less likely as we move to various vibrational quanta. So here, for example, moving up to the new prime equals two wave function is going to be most favorable with nu equals three having a much lower probability, likewise with nu equals one and down from there. And if we can see peaks for these various vibrational levels, which we can under the right circumstances, we can get a sense of what the potential energy surfaces look like, connecting experimental data to the shapes of potential energy surfaces. And what about Fermi's golden rule? Well, we actually saw this equation previously, and it, it really returns to our fundamental model of how non-radiative transitions take place. A non-radiative transition requires some kind of perturbation that takes the initial state and gives it some probability of transforming into the final state. That perturbation can be described by a series of matrix elements. It can be described by a matrix, right, where the rows and columns are the possible wave functions, the, the space of wave functions for initial and final states. And the transition re rate is related to that perturbation matrix element and the density of states in the final state. This is Fermi's golden rule stated out loud. And here's the mathematical form of it. And we're finally connecting a rate constant here for the initial to final transition to the matrix element and the density of states. So this is where the rate constant connection finally comes in. As we said, we would get to this point where we're, we finally precisely specify the rate constant. That's happening here. And it's equal to the rate of change of the probability of the transition with respect to time. The steeper that probability is increasing with time, the faster the rate. So V here, as it's defined, is the perturbation matrix element from an initial state, psi i, to a final state, psi f. We've seen this previously, familiar with this. And rho is what we call the density of states. And rho needs to be included because there, there may be more than one final state at or in the vicinity of the final energy, ef. And if there is, we have to account for the fact that the more states we have at EF, the faster the rate will be, since there are multiple potential states that, that the system could occupy. This figure does a nice job of illustrating how the final density of states depends on the energy gap between the I and F states. The larger the energy gap is, the greater the density of states in the final state, because in general, states get closer together as we move up in energy. Vibrational levels just get closer together due to the large number of vibrational modes in an organic molecule and all that kind of thing. So the larger the energy gap then, the greater the density of states. However, by far the more important feature here is the perturbation matrix element. And within that, in particular, the vibrational piece, the Frank Condon factors. As the energy gap between the initial and final states increases, 
we start having to use a much, much higher vibrational level of the lower state to match the ground vibrational level of the upper state in order to do a horizontal transition. You know, put another way, the ground electronic state has to be in this vibrational state with all of this waving at a very high energy, very large number of vibrational quanta, right? Very high quantum number, vibrational quantum number in order to do this transition. And the Frank Condon overlap is very poor. And you, you can see that from the graph. And we saw that when we defined Frank Condon factor on the last slide. Very, very poor Frank Condon inter, uh, overlap. And it's gonna get worse, right? As we pull this down and, and move to even higher vibrational levels. This results in a strong decrease of the perturbation matrix element as the energy gap increases. It's exponential, as we'll see on the next slide. And this results in an energy gap law which that describes qualitatively the dependence of the rate constant on the energy gap between the electronic initial and final states. In other words, we're looking at the ground vibrational levels of the initial and final states when we talk about this energy gap law. The greater that gap is, the slower the transition is. And this is what we call the energy gap law. Let's state it one more time because the qualitative impact of this law is very important. The greater delta E between the initial and final states, and in particular, the ground vibrational levels of the electronic states, the slower the rate. Very important intuition to develop. And it's an exponential dependence. So we can think about this like there is a prohibition factor, right, F, that is proportional to or similar to either the negative delta E. As delta E increases, this number gets tiny very rapidly. Let's look at two examples of this. The first example we've already seen, Kasha's rule, the idea that internal conversion from higher singlet states, say, down to S1 is much more rapid than conversion of S1 back to S0. Why is this? Well, S1 and S2 and S3 and S4 and so on and so forth are much more closely spaced in energy in general than S1 and S0. Usually there's a huge gap here between S0 and S1, but the gaps between S1 and S2, S2 and S3, etc., are much smaller. Those smaller gaps result in faster transitions from S2 to S1, or S3 to S2, or S4 to S3, etc. The energy gap law has experimental support, and this graph from a paper by Seabrand in the 60s is a really nice example of this. What he did was he measured the rate of T1 to S0 intersystem crossing as a function of the triplet energy, essentially, the energy difference between the T1 state and the ground state, the S0 state. And he plotted the rate as its logarithm on the y-axis here. So log kts is the logarithm of this rate constant for the t1 to s0 transition. And on the x-axis, he plotted essentially the triplet energy. Basically, the t1 s0 energy difference is plotted along the x-axis. And you can see for both sets of data, and we'll get to the difference in a second, for both sets of data, there is a strong linear decrease in the logarithm of the rate as the energy gap increases, indicating this exponential dependence. The difference between the two data sets is that the open circles were deuterated aromatic hydrocarbons with all the hydrogens replaced with deuterium, while the closed circles were simple hydrogenated standard aromatic hydrocarbons. Replacing hydrogen with deuterium caused an increase in the rate across the board, pretty much, of T1 to S0 intersystem crossing. And this was attributed to the fact that the CD bonds are stronger than the CH bonds and their vibrational frequencies are higher. As a result of that, it takes fewer vibrational quanta to match the energy of the S0 state to the ground vibrational level of the T1 state. And as such, the Frank Condon factors are better for the deuterated compounds than they are for the hydrogenated compounds. The C brand paper has more detail on this, but it's an excellent demonstration of the energy gap law and Fermi's golden rule in the sense that the Frank Condon factors are responsible for this difference in the 
rate constants of the deuterated and hydrogenated compounds. 